Hello and a very warm welcome to another Talking, Talking Change, change with, with Ruda on uh, the Change Exchange. And it's about the change moments when life makes decisions for you or sometimes you manage to make them yourself and uh, your life suddenly takes a different direction. And uh, today I'm talking to someone whose life has been such a, an ongoing change moment, I think. Nsiki Biela, South Africa's first black woman winemaker, the owner and winemaker of Aslina Wines. Numerous awards for herself as a business person and for her wines over the years. And uh, Tiki, you had never tasted wine until you got to university. Is that right? Yep. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I hadn't tasted wine. So I, I remember that whenever people spoke of wine, at that moment, for me, wine was, which is what I realized when I got here, it was ciders. <coughs> Sorry. It was what? Cider? Cider. That's what I thought was wine. So, <laughs> Until I got here, and then I found out that actually, no, those are ciders, it's not wine. So, <laughs> There's a difference. Yeah. <laughs> I a want difference. To, to. For me, it's actually... like, oh, it's all wine. So. Yeah. I want to, to just take you one step back. You grew up in a, a small village in KZN, and, but you had this aspiration to become a chemical engineer. What kind of a yeah, kid, kid were, were you? you? <laughs> I would think I was, was a curious, curious kid. kid. Um, I think when I look back from when I went to register in primary school, all I wanted was, it's, it, it's things that I see now that it was that curiosity of knowing that life is more than what I see in my village, that there's something more than what I see here in the village. Um, so I wanted that too. How did you know that? Because uh, that was your world ended at the, the, the hills around you? Um, I think as much as I know that nowadays we've got social media, da, 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 you go through all these things, which I'm glad we didn't have at that time because <laughs> I think I would, be over, I would have been overwhelmed, which is what is happening even today with me on social media. But um, I remember when I was growing up, the only time I could see most people, most were, people, driving cars, people were driving most people cars, were cars, owning most, shops. Most people were owning um, shops. When you go to town, um, when you go to town. And and yes, there were shops. Yes, there were I shops, remember, I remember the shop where my grandfather, grandfather was working, working as a security, security guard. Those mm -hmm. were, which is now I value, those were black owned shops. But I could only see mostly white people coming driving past the village. And like, you wonder where they are going, where they come from. Like, th there was that. So, so much so I remember at some, some point, point when I went to uh, study to, to, to grade, well, now it's called grade R, but when I got to primary school, the first class, uh, um, one of the teachers asked me what I wanted to become when I get old. And I said, I want to be Mloom. Because for <laughs> me, Mloom, you are, you're studying to be that. And because, yeah, it's like you're studying to be. It wasn't something that, you born it's a color or something. something for me it was like you started to be <laughs> yes that says so much about our country actually yeah huh? yeah but then um the after matric you didn't have uh, there was no funding and instead of starting on a on a route to becoming a chemical engineer you had to work as a domestic worker yes that must so, have been Absolutely terrifying. I'm not terrifying. No, but, but... I, funny enough, I wasn't. <laughs> the, the, this was the thing for me. I wanted change. So anything that was coming that was different from what I'm doing. Uh. Anything that is different from what I'm doing, that looks a step better than what I'm doing. So if you finish my trick and you don't have a job, so any job in my view is better than not having a job. Right? So there's a job, domestic work. Perfect. It's in the city. city. I'm going to be in a different I'm going place, to be in a different space, different place, meet different people, different space. Do something meet different, different people. and earn money. Do something different and earn money. So, so there was a, there change, was a change for me. For it, was, me. it was a stepping, stepping stone, stone towards, towards something. something. And I think what was very um, positive about it was I was told that, okay, fine. If 
when you get there, you're going to, if you want to study, we'll pay for your studies. You'll do your chores after and before school. And I was up for the challenge. I was like, I'll do that. Because all I could say, I'm going to study. <laughs> if it means I don't sleep, then that's fine. But I'm going to study. I'm going to uh, be able to see my dream come true. And, you know, th there was a target. So with that in mind, I agreed. Mm. And when I got there, and then there was this scholarship for winemaking that came along. So, and what what did you think seeing this this uh, possibility? And it said winemaking. What what, what was, was the picture, picture in your head? My pic the picture in my head was I was going to be making hands and crossbows. And crossbows. <laughs> <laughs> Those were the two that I knew. Those were the two wines at that time. Yeah. That I... yeah. <laughs> and it's the most wonderful story of you sitting in the bus and driving into the Western Cape because this was the other thing you were going to, Stellenbosch, which is a, a different world from rural KwaZulu Natal and even Durban. Yeah. Um, and you saw the, the, these little stunted trees all planted in rows and you asked, what's that? <laughs> Yep. And those were the vineyards. Those so you the really vineyards. didn't have a clue what you were getting into. I didn't even know what I was getting myself into. You know, I remember when I was talking on the phone with the people from SAA and they were telling me that it's in Afrikaans. I was like, oh, Len. You know, I was like, you know, when sometimes not to know is good and be curious. curious. Not know something, yes. but not curious, curious about, about it. But curious it's good. about it. Because it's good. with because that, it was that, like, it's in Afrikaans. It's in Afrikaans. I was like, Len, you know, so it, it wasn't something that was for me out of this world. And how did, how did you experience, how did you experience that um, having to learn the language before you could study? Hard. <sighs> that was, <laughs> let, let me say it was, you know, when you're like in an alien world, because everyone is talking, but you've got no clue what they're saying. Um, and you try and, and you realize that I thought we we're living Afrikaans at school, but no. You were just expected to understand. No, but it was very like it was whatever we learned at school. It was very it was just to know, to know a bit a bit. But, but when you're being lectured, when you're being you listening to people speaking in the language, speaking in the language, it's something, something else. else. And you realize that I think one of the things I knew is that I cannot fail. I cannot go back home. I have to get this. That I was, it's like, I was sure this is what I want. I'm going to get it. I don't know in this mess because that was a mess that you are in a space. You, you are, are studying and I remember calling my sister and Devin Gonzo and I said I even dreamt because this is the thing I even I remember calling her I was crying I dreamt I had failed and then the university kicked me out of school and and she's like no it was just a dream and I'm like it's not because it's in Africa I don't understand anything you know so you yeah, this all these things because it is just too much yeah. at the same time and I met another friend of mine who said you know what there is student there counseling. Is student counseling. Go to student Go counseling. To student counseling. Get, get, you know. And I was like, okay, great. So I went to student counseling. Um, and the first thing I told them is that I'm going to fail. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, I said, there's pockets, you know. Like, okay, I'm going to fail. The university is going to kick me out, but I'm not going to go back home. I want to stay here. So you guys, need to, it's like, I was clear. So you guys need to help me. And they're like, but there's nothing we can do. But I mean, the minute they said there was nothing they could do, and then I started crying because I'm like, so there goes my hope again, you know? And they're like, okay, 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 fine. You have to come to counseling. I had to go, go to counseling every week. And then they said, if you fail, then we're going to talk to the university. They will give you a second chance. And they started giving me all these other options that were happening at the university. So... This is what happened. So now I have a backup plan. Okay. okay. So that so made me calm, made me calm. Then I could then focus. focus. So I just, I just need, need to be calm, calm and be focused. focused. So, so like, like, I know I've, I've got, got a backup plan, plan so, so I can give everything. everything. So, so that if it doesn't work, I know that I did it, but I still have another chance to try again. And then I passed my and first year. So that was like, your first year. 
Yes. Bloody yes. marvelous. <laughs> that hell that I went through for the past. <laughs> And, and uh, uh, you, you started, started working, working part time or uh, while you were studying. You started working at Deline. Yeah, yeah. And there too, you were. I mean, talk about the X among the O's. You were completely just different from everyone else. You were a woman. You were black. You were not Afrikaans speaking. Well, I think with Delheim, it was different though. Delheim. If I were to talk about, I don't know then because I hadn't been to a lot of wineries. But if I look now and look at Delheim then, I, I could, could confidently, confidently say, say they, they were, were one of the first wineries that were employing a lot of black people. Mm. If, if I, I, on the managerial positions, um, because that tasting room manager was a black guy, they had a lot of students. They, like, they were, I think they were already, you know, in for change. So at that point, this, this was this was when about two thousand. That's about two thousand. Yeah, yeah. So that so, is forward thinking. Then the, Delheim was already there. So when I got to Delheim, actually, it felt like I'm at home. It wasn't feeling like, oops, I'm alone. And you know, mm. I got to Delheim, and I was like, hmm, okay, you know. And there were it was me and my friends. And I remember one of my friends, she was like, when she arrived the following year, I said to her, go look for a job at Delhi. And I said, I know they're going to hire you. Hire so it was, you know, all students. So then she went to the coach. So, so then she went to so the coach. So they were hiring students. They were hiring students. Open to students. And so it was, I think, yeah, no, Delhi was already for forward thinking in those cases. And that must have given you a lot of confidence and made you feel that, yes, I can do this. I can, I can actually take my place in this world. So they, it, they did you an did. enormous favor. Uh, well, not favor, but they helped. It, it did. I remember I worked with a winemaker, Philip Constantius in the cellar. Um, Philip wasn't much on speaking English. He was struggling with English. But there was one thing I'll tell you that made me realize that, you know, as a human, we've, we, are spirit. we, we are spirits, right? So because we're spirit, you feel when a person is with you, is on your side and all that. And I could feel, if, it, if Philip could have done it, he would have taken the information and injected it to me because he wanted to teach me so much. He was, he was even though he was struggling, even though he was with the language to speak English, in the language to speak but, English, but he was, he um, was, um, he was, he like was, he wanted, like he wanted to, to, I could see he, I could wanted, see he wanted to, wanted to you know, you know, so, so and, and all the lessons we got when I was at Delheim, and I remember, one of the general managers, it was um, Harald at that moment, Harald Brevet at that moment, he was going to a winemaker seminar. So he says to me, come with me, let's go to the winemaker seminar. I was like, okay, get excited, going to the winemaker seminar, it's all exciting, until we got to the door. Uh, there was only men, there was one woman registering everyone at the door. So I was like, okay, at least there's a woman. Until she finished and closed her book and left. <laughs> and I was like, Bama. And I was like, I don't think I want to get in here. And he said, if you don't get in, how do you think this is going to change? It's going to change. Sure, sure. I was like, oh, no, it's not going to change. It's like, no, it's not going to change. I mean, this one, it looked, that, that was the moment that was terrifying for me. That was the moment that was terrifying for me because... You know, you are on campus, you're studying, most things are done in Afrikaans. Yes, you've got tutors and all that. And you the negative um, treatment that comes from the students at that moment, because you get this question, what are you doing in an Afrikaans university if you don't understand? It wasn't what they're asking, it's about how they were asking it. Mm. Uh, when the lecturer is trying to speak English, they'll make noise because it's an Afrikaans university, you can't do that. You know, so... You're having that on the background, and then you get to a seminar that is all white, all men, and you're thinking, damn it. That was my most terrifying moment about thinking of getting into the industry. Did you, did you think for a moment, maybe I'm making a mistake? Maybe I, I, I should just 
walk away and choose a different path? I don't know if I did think of that. If I did, but that means I didn't entertain it because mm. it was one of those, but I remember that I was terrified. Mm. And when we came back, which was very interesting, when we came back from the seminar, the seminar was in Paul. Paul is still like very far behind and the, obviously still in Paul, the university, so it's called students. Um, and I remember we went and passed by one of the shop because Herod wanted to buy sunglasses. People were staring at us. And I thought to myself, okay. Initially, I wasn't aware what I'm like. So I remember saying to him, I'm like, what's happening? And he's laughing. He's like, no, they're seeing an African guy with a black girl. Mm. They're seeing a white girl, a guy with a white a black girl. They are thinking, what the hell? Mm. You know? And and funny enough, when he, all this was happening, and I could see that he was so entertained with all the reaction. And it's like, it's like somebody saying, yeah, I want them to feel <laughs> but yeah so it, it was it was very interesting i think those were the moments of realizing what the industry is about what the industry is and the need for change for the industry so it just stiffened your backbone it just made you say i will it, like it, it i was like yeah yeah so and then I realized that, damn, that means that Delham, I'm cushioned because I don't see all this. You know, you don't see all this. You don't experience all this. Mm. So it, it, it was one of those. And just directly from leaving university, you got a job as a junior winemaker at Stella Kaya. Yes. Can you remember, I mean, getting your first job in, in any direction, is a huge thing. But for you, in under those circumstances, with, against that background, what, what was that like? Do you remember getting what did you get? A telegram, a, a, a phone call, a, a letter to say you've got the job? I think when I went for an interview um, at Stedeka, I remember um, the owner, Dave Lello, when he was taking me for a seller tour. I don't even remember what he was telling me about the things that was happening in the cellar. All I was in my mind is like, just hire me. <laughs> <laughs> because the winery looks so beautiful, small. It was, I'm going to say, Stelica was everything I've hoped to start with. I had hoped to work in a small winery. I had wanted to, so, to be in a place where I can work in all aspects of the business. One thing I was aware when I was graduating is that I don't want to work in a big company. That I was mm. aware. I wanted a place where I can be involved in everything. Mm. And so Stelica was exactly that. I think, again, it's one of those where we like, you look back and like, God, thank you. Actually, you directed that part. That's what I wanted. It came exactly as if I, as if I placed an order and then it got delivered. That's what <laughs> Yeah. So and and um, you working. Um, I had a consultant. Um, I was working involved in the vineyards, involved in the tasting room, making the wine, involved in the market, basically involved everywhere, part of the business. And one thing I learned mostly was, um, my boss was one of those people. You now talk about leaders. That's where I realized what a leader is. Because it was never a person who stands behind you to say, okay, move this left, move. It's like, this is your space, deal with it. You'll come and look for me when you need help. But also he was a person who was not, or still is not a person who says, I cannot make coffee for people. Mm. I'll be sitting in a meeting and he will come through and he goes, oh, do you guys want some coffee or tea? And that for me was how human he is, how grounded he is. You know, he wasn't a boss. He was mm. human. Oh, he is, sorry. Busy using the words as if, but <laughs> in the yeah. context, he's my yeah. previous boss. Uh, so, but like human, that's, mm. that's what I realized. And, and I was no, like, emphasis, no emphasis on the, on the hierarchy. Um, no, there was I no, am more hierarchy. important or I am above you. Or, no, yeah. there was no emphasis on the hierarchy. 
There was no emphasis. It's just that we know that he's the boss, is the person we need to go to when we need staff, when we were, you know, but yes. there was no emphasis on the hierarchy. Yeah, it was and a team. All, sorry, we were a team. A team. Mm. Yeah, fantastic. And then your, your very first wine, am I correct, won a, a, a medal at the Michelangelo Awards. Yes. Um, it oh, was a Cape What was that like? <laughs> that actually, there is, wow, that day actually was one of the most fascinating, heartwarming days. I remember that evening. We're sitting at the table. Where, um, where was it held? Where were the awards? It was held, at sea. It was at, held sea. at sea. Yeah. Sitting at the table, obviously things are getting sorted and whatnot. And so when the awards have been called, um, I know that we were only two black people. It was me and Tari Romasait who was working for Niederberg at that time. Um, he's a winemaker there. He was a winemaker there. And the only black people that were at the event with waiters and waitresses. So when, when um, the, the awards were called and immediately when the wine was called, they said, the waiters and waitresses jumped up and down. They were so excited. I was like, I was not aware that they know me. I wasn't aware that actually, like, they were so excited. And, yeah, I was, like, that was, for me, actually heartwarming. And I was like, oh, wow. So, yeah. Ziki, but it's also, it's quite a, um, how can I put it, a, a responsibility. You are, uh, to, to be the first one, to, to, and feel in that moment that, I am a role model. They are looking at me and I am opening possibilities for them that they may never have noticed, may never have thought would be, would be possibilities. Is there a feeling like that? Um, I think at the beginning, um, I remember when I started at Selekai, at the beginning when, remember, that was the first interview I had because I didn't even know, you know that, that, what, what, that, what it was. And I remember sitting with my boss and I said, I can't do this. I don't want you know, journalists. I don't, can I just be my, I don't want to be a role model. Yes. Because my picture of a role model, it meant I'm going to need to tow a line, walk on a plank and be careful of not falling, kind of. Mm. And my boss sat down with me and his sister, his sister, was, had, I think she was a psychologist of some sort, but she was working with him at that time now, joined the company. And then she said, they sat me down. And <laughs> I remember going to their office. I said, you know, when you come in and then I sat on the floor. I literally sat on the floor on the tiles. And I was like, I can't do this. <laughs> and, then, and then he was like, no, actually, this means you're just going to be yourself. Don't worry about what's happening. Just be yourself and do things that you want to do, that you're happy to do. And dream your dreams. You're not doing things for someone. You're doing it for yourself. And it's just that people are looking at what you do. And I'm like, but can they not look? Can they just not look? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so that was that. And it was, yeah. It, 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 it's a responsibility. It's um, but it was when I grow with growth that I realized that actually it is a blessing to be in that position. To um we get our inspiration in different spaces. If I could be one of those pockets where people get their inspiration, where people get their aha moment, where people can get some, pick up something on whatever I'm doing that can make them turn their lives into whatever dreams they want, that would be awesome. So, yeah. And tell me about um, traveling for the first time, going to France, going to Italy, to the wine estates. Um, how did you experience that? Did that change you? So my first trip overseas, let's see. That was in 2005. 
So I started working in 2004, 2005, I got a trip to go to France to do my harvest there. That was the very first trip out of the country. Um, my bosses were worried. <laughs> so I felt like I was like, like yeah, they, they were worried. Um, worried about what? I, because I've never been out of the country. They were worried about my safety. They were worried about how am I going to be comfortable? Am I going to be okay there and all that? Because what I had done is I went to one of the guys in the corporate company, um, just Demtos, and I said, actually, I would like to go harvest in France. And they were like, okay, we'll organize a company that we can go work with. So there was a company in South Africa that connected with me, the, with a the company in France and organized for me to go and harvest there. And... It was just after one of my colleagues had gone to France and she had a bad, very bad experience. So, but when I was supposed to go and my bosses were really worried. But anyways, and I was like, no, I'm going to be fine. And they're like, immediately you feel uncomfortable, you call us. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I went to France, I got picked up and the owner there picked me up and and then I remember I was at the following day, he says, I think your bosses, they keep on calling to check if you are fine. Can they just accept that you're fine? <laughs> and I was like, well, they are worried because they've never met you. Mm -hmm. And so, like, it's just a concern for them. It's like, you know, and I think around that time, my boss and his friends, they went to France to watch rugby. So rugby, it was a World Cup. And so they decided to take a day and they came and asked for me, they took a day with me to drive around France to show me a little bit of France. So, yeah. And how did you experience it? Did it, did it change your life? Um, open your horizons? What, what, it did. what did I it think mean for you? For me, one of the things is I've realized I can go in any place. Yes. For me, the place is beautiful because of people. You can take me to anything that you think is beautiful, but if the people mm. are not nice, are not human, are not kind, I think, I think that has been my experience globally in all the countries I've gone to. So when I was there, I made friends. Um, I remember, obviously, the boss was even worried. Like, I'm, I'm going to sleep at a friend for the weekend, and he goes, Who's that? And he had to go see the people, see their house. So I'm going, you know, he's like, I'm not taking chances with you. <laughs> so, um, so I, I had a good time. I think one of the things I learned was in France, they were putting, when it's time, time for breakfast and it's time for lunch, they took, I'm going to call it breaking bread together, seriously. Mm. Breakfast will all sit together, have coffee, have bread, whatever that's going to be eaten for breakfast because the winery preps breakfast. The winery preps lunch. So lunchtime, everyone from the vineyard will all sit together, will have lunch, have some wine. And so that experience for me was fantastic because the interaction with people and, you know, playing and all those things, it was just making work to understand that we are human. Work is the means to an end, but it mustn't be the key. Mm -hmm. Work is helping us to be able to live a certain life or a better life, or whatever that life is. So, yeah. Did you also um, make a connection with uh, the American woman, um, Helen Keplinger? Was that, did you meet her while you were at Stelakaya? Because it sounds as if she made a difference um, later. Yes, I met, it was Mika Bulmash, actually, that I met. And so Mika wanted to do a collaboration wine between a wine, an South African winemaker and an American winemaker. And I was the one she met in South Africa. And then she connected me to Helen Kepling. And then we made a collaboration wine, and which we exported to the US. And then a few years later, then I made a, I made, when I started Aslina, Mika still continued to be the importer. Uh, I see. Uh, tell me about the decision to go on your own. That's uh, oh, it's a huge step, huh? After 12 years of having a salary and a, and a wonderful working environment, it sounds like, and now stepping out into the big wide world yourself. Yeah, I think 
one thing I knew is that even when I was a student, I knew that at some point I want to start my own company. I didn't know what it was at that point, but I knew that I want to start a company when I, when I was a student. So um, hence, even when I was like, I want to work in a small winery, it was more so that I can be involved in everything and learn as much and understand what it takes to actually make things work or to run a company or something like that. So that actually, that worked, that helped. So I then, when it was time, I think it was made of just progression. When it was time, it was like, okay, now I need to jump. But that was really terrifying because you're like, what if, what if, what if? But at the end of the day, you're like, what's the difference? That was the question. What is the difference? How do what you I'm mean, doing what is now? It? it was, what is the difference from what I'm doing now and what I will do mm. if I start mm. a company? Mm. In terms of work, there was no difference. The only difference was it's a different brand. And the only difference was the money has to come from it. <laughs> that's a huge difference. That's, I mean, you that, that that was the security. The security part, yes. So that was the difference, and that was the issue with the security part. So, but I was like, oh well. So one of those like, oh well, let's just fly. Let's see how it's gonna work. <laughs> <laughs> and do you remember the first time you held a bottle with the Aslina label? Yes, I do. I do. I think, <laughs> yeah, I think that was for me. It was, it was like watching Lion King. I know it sounds weird, right? It was like watching Lion King. And you know that part where the, the curb is being held up? Yes. That was oh, the yes. moment. Yeah. Oh, okay. That, yeah. This is my yeah. baby. I'm presenting it. <laughs> that, that, that was the moment. It was basically that moment of the curb. Yes. So, yeah. Yes. And... Um, when did you know that it will work as a business? Um, I, <laughs> this is the funny part. I knew it's going to work. I couldn't tell. But if you were to ask me then details, how is it going to work? I didn't know how, but I knew it was going to work. I just didn't know how. Yeah. I didn't yeah. have the, I didn't have, the financial backup, I didn't have, I didn't have those things that you can say, yes, financially, there's going to be this, there's money that's going to come so I can, you know, but I knew it's going to work. Um, I think, <laughs> I think one of the things is, um, again, I'm grateful to have mentors. Um, I'm grateful to have friends. I remember when I was starting, uh, the High Road Winery, Les Swiden. <laughs> he was like, uh, he used to call me like, child, what do you want? <laughs> I, was like, I was like, well, he's like, you're starting a company. Financially, what is it that you need? And I was like, and I got scared to say, okay, this is the man, because like, I know the people used to call me like, <laughs> okay, loan you money. because the banks don't give you money when you start up. They don't know. You know, they want all these things that they want and do like, how do you think I'm going to get those if you don't borrow me money? But he was like, so I told him how much I wanted. And he said, okay, fine. We'll give you the money, pay it when you can. Sure. He was like, did you just say pay it when you can? Like, Yeah, yeah. So for me, those were signs of saying, someone believes in what I'm doing. Yes. Someone knows this is going to work. Someone, you know? And so yes. I was like, yeah. So the um, high road winery was like one of those. They were like, and then my mentors were there with two. I think among my jobs that I was doing <laughs> when I started the company 
one of the job that I, I'm going to say I didn't like, not that I didn't like, it was stressing me every time I have to do it. Cash flow. Mm. So much I learned that I cannot do cash flow at night <laughs> because then I can't sleep. <laughs> I couldn't. If I've done it late in the evening, that means I'm not going to sleep until morning because my brain is trying to figure mm. out where that money ways that's going to come from. So I learned that if I have to do cash flow, I need to do it in the morning. But whenever I had to do it, I would be so stressed up because it had to do with numbers and all those things. And like, <laughs> but those are the key things when you're starting a business, yeah. understanding your cash flow and make, keeping an eye on it. So, yeah. so how, did you, how did you learn that? Because that was also not, it, it's not included in any winemaking course or anything. So did you find a mentor specifically or did you study? What did you do? Well, I had a mentor um, and um, yeah, I had a mentor, uh, not that I had, I have still. My, <laughs> my mentor is a financial person and he would be like, Nsegi, you need to do your cash flow. Like I knew when we talk about cash flow, because I know what's going to be happening, where, yeah. where should, what should fall where. I knew how to put that thing up and I, I remember a friend of mine had to create for me the spreadsheet because I will tell him what, put this there, put that there, there, in that month, do this. Like I knew how these things should fall. But now every month I need to update these spreadsheets and make sure that they, they work. And I'll update it and look at the big statement and do all those things. So it was a matter of just being coached there and there to say, okay, fine. For me, it was a matter of getting somebody to put a template up for me. And then I had a template, then I could work on it. But it was stressful all the time, every time I have to do it. <laughs> I still feel that way when I have to do my tax. <laughs> That's the thing. So, but now I don't have to do that. So the company has grown. Yes, yes. And now you, you have a team. And, now and Siki, your life has changed. Where are we now? 2021. So it's, it's two decades um, since you were that girl on the bus. Um. You have said that you, you find yourself living in two worlds. Yeah. Talk about that. So I think I, I've come to accept basically the Western Cape for me is a work of a place of work. Hmm. Um, living this European style life, everything you're doing, it's not your cultural basic stuff. But it's not the place that grounds me. It's a place where... I put my energy to do things and create and do and create and build, you know. Now and again, I need to go home because that's where I get grounded. That's where my heart gets fulfilled. That's where my cup is filled. That's where I basically, I just, I, I'm being, you know. So, um, and I love that. I love that. I embrace that. I enjoy it. And I know when I'm starting to feel unbalanced when I'm here and I'm like trying to crumble with things, I'm struggling. I'm like, oh, 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 go home. Then I'll get home. Um, go with friends, go fetch wood, go in that, do those things that I was doing when I was growing up, those basic stuff. Mm. Mm. Your family, your, your original family is very important, have been very important in your life. Hmm? Um, yes. Aslina was your granny's name. Yes, that's my grandmother's name. Yeah. Look, she, if I were to, I think for me, there are different people in life that would describe them with different names. If I were to point out, talk about love, for me, she is love. That's if, if I were to have something that is visible, that I would say, this is love, for me, she is. And I think she, she taught me a lot of stuff. She was a kind of a woman who tends 20 cents to be a something big, you know. So she had that abundance in her hands that she would tend something that is nothing and make it something. So in that way, those are things I learned. Mm -hmm. And um, the physical space, you say you want to go home, you want to be there, go and fetch wood, et cetera. What kind of home have you made for yourself in the Western Cape? What, what does it look like? What's your space like? 
<laughs> it's it's like a wet space. <laughs> you don't invest your heart there. I, I am trying. I am trying. <laughs> obviously, you know, I bought a flat. Mm. Um, that I'm making a home, but it's a home because it's a space. But when I say I'm going home, I'm mm. never talking about the space. I'm always talking about home where my family is, where my mom is, where my aunts are, where mm. my cousins and sisters are, where when I get home, we go chase chickens. <laughs> that is where, like, that is where life is. Yeah. And when I wake up in the morning at my aunts and the goat is like literally sitting in front of whatever on the blocks and, mm. you know, all those things where, when the sun comes out early in the morning, I'm standing outside, I'm looking at it, and you can hear chickens running around. Mm. For me, that is home. And did you bring something physical, maybe um, some fabric that you've put up somewhere, or I don't know what, um, something that you hold with you, keep with you all the time when you're not home? No. Oh. Not really. No, I don't mm. think what what I've tried to do, but it still doesn't. I don't think it's got that much of. I, I use calabashes. I've got calabashes that I have, mm. um, I've got, and like once we get a tasting room, because we're in the process of getting us a tasting room. Once we've got a tasting room, we've got to have calabashes in our tasting room because, yeah, you know, you just have to. Yes. <laughs> so. Yeah. yeah. And one last question or one last subject. Uh, we usually in these conversations also talk about the personal stuff, um, a partner maybe or whatever, but you keep your personal life completely separate. What is behind that decision and why? And why do you protect it so, so fiercely? I think for me, it is my secret space. Mm. it is my comfortable space and so if I start sharing it out there I feel like I don't have a place to run to mm. when when things are hard outside I need to be outside and when I come back home feel that I'm home mm. feel that I'm with the people whom no one is going to be prying to Mm. No one's going to say, but we want to know what's happening now, you know? So it's, it's, it's my personal life. It's my, I, yeah. I don't think there's something that I need to, you know, wh whatever is personal, I want to keep it personal. And whatever is business that I'm sure that people learn from, I need to give to people. Mm. And plans and dreams for us, Lena? What's going, what can we expect? And please don't have no expectations. <laughs> but um, we are working on, look, we, we don't have a home of our own. And so because we don't have a home of our own, we are working towards having a home. It will be, at some point, to be one of the greatest things to have our own production facility, our own cellar, our own farm, our own vineyards, our own everything, where we, we're walking, you walk in at the gate, you can, um, th there's this thing we do in the rural village that when you come to someone's house, especially if you are a man, then you need to stand at the gate and call the, the ancestral names and mm. to, to come in, to be welcome into the, that's what we want to have. I can oh. only see it happening. If if you put it out there and uh, you really want it, it will happen. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> Thank you so much for making time to talk to us and um, for for being what and who you are. And congratulations. You've it's amazing. Thank you so Good much. Thank you okay. So much. okay. And to to our viewers, thank you. Thank you for watching, for listening, for sharing. Until the next time, go well.